Our first scripture reading this morning is Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, and can be found on page 960 in the Pew Bibles. Jesus' own words from the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. It is not, is not life more than food? and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The second scripture reading is also an account of Jesus' own words this time to his disciples in Mark 10, verses 13 through 16, which can be found on page 1002 in the Pew Bibles. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, be with us now. Speak to us and through us. Nourish us with the knowledge of your abiding love and the present and presence in our lives. And may all of the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Amen. So summertime is here, and it's kind of gotten me to thinking a little bit, because there's a cultural rhythm that we have in our year, and what that means is that we have been taught from very early age, just from school, we, school years and everything, that summertime is when we take a break. Even when those of us who have moved on in life and, and for whom summertime does not offer a break, we still have that feeling. We still have that feeling that summertime brings break time. It's a, it's a great time. It's, I mean, people are going on vacations. They're planning vacations, going on vacations. They're, they're, they're doing all kinds of things that, that just, I don't know, it just feels like things are just, just slow down a little bit, and it's just a little more relaxing. In the church, however, it doesn't always feel that way. Granted, there is progr there are programs that take a break during the summertime, but we just seem to replace those with other things. And that sometimes makes us feel even busier than, or, or just as busy anyways, as we have throughout. There's, and, and, and in our church, there's, well, there's annual conference, as Brian and I know, and there's, there's also camping, and there is uh, vacation Bible school, if you noticed all the jungle. That is why this is here. The Vacation Bible School broke out in our church last week. And so it just feels so, so very busy. And it's truly a joyful, well, 
but the the thing about these things is that is that while it is a joy to be in ministry in these ways, what we sometimes forget is that minus a annual conference, most of the ministries that pop up during the summertime in the life of a church are specific to children and young people and youth. And it truly is a joy to be in ministry with the young people. But I think sometimes we forget to, we forget something. We're fo so focused on what it is we're going to teach them that we forget to notice what it is they teach us. And so with this whole thing, I, I, I got to thinking, you know, last week David preached on uh, a question. He, he posed a question to you that I think people are often afraid to ask, probably because they're afraid of what the answer might be. And he preached on a, on a question was, is faith painful? But there's another question that I want, that got me to thinking. There is another question. There are many questions, but this is another one that we can consider as well. This is also a question that we're afraid to ask ourselves, but not because we're afraid of the answer. We're just flat out afraid that it's heretical. Like we're somehow being blasphemous by asking this particular question. We don't even want to entertain this question just in case, because we might be really bad by asking it. Can faith be playful? We're worried to ask that question because we think that we're not allowed to. But as a preacher, usually the process is of a preacher is that you're given, a, that you, you find a scripture you know, or a piece of scripture. It might be something that has come as a part of a series. It might be something that for lectionary preachers that is in the lectionary cycle. Or it might just be what has been planned out already for a series of sermons. But typically you start with a scripture. And then a topic bubbles up from that as you pray and work through the sermon, for sermon writing process. But sometimes, sometimes, what pops into your head, like what just happened this last week for me with that question, you get a topic before you get a scripture. And so then you have to kind of retroactively find yourself a scripture that packs up what the topic is that you're trying to preach on. And so that's what I did this last week. And I made a pretty bad discovery because on the topic of can faith be playful, there's really no explicit scripture that backs that up. I don't know if I ever noticed that before. I mean, I've never really specifically gone into scripture f to find an answer to the question, can faith be playful? Or maybe I just blocked it out for some reason. I don't know. Maybe I did know it. But, but either way, it's there in black and white. There are references to some sort of playing and dancing and creativity and celebration. There are references to it, but no explicit mention. And to be fair, early Christians didn't help a whole lot either. Author Robert Johnston says that the issue of play has been a controversy for a long time. He says, from the time of St. Augustine down to the present era, Christians have often been suspicious of play. For Augustine, conversion to Christianity meant a conversion from a life of play. To him, even eating was sinful if done in a spirit of pleasure. This way of thinking was fueled further in the modern period by the Protestant work ethic, an all-out work and no-play lifestyle was one of the evidences that God had truly redeemed a person. This is the faith that we have inherited. And we need to remember that, that while we do have our church fathers and mothers that did hand down a lot of theology and everything that we still work with to this day, they were human beings as well, flawed human beings just like the rest of us. And when we read some of Augustine's stuff, if you've ever studied Augustine, he had some stuff. <laughs> there, was, there, there, was, there, was, there was stuff that informed a lot of Augustine's writings. They're as brilliant as they are. So we need to remember those things. And so receiving these things from them is very important, but we also need to kind of look at it with a critical eye. And this kind of idea of this quote that I just read, that, that uh, an all work and no play lifestyle was one of the evidences that God had truly redeemed a person, it started me to think a couple of things. It brought a couple of things into focus for me. First of all, 
it's no wonder we have such a hard time convincing people to come to church. <laughs> Who wants to come and not have any fun? I mean, uh, we don't have to have fun all the time, but, there, you know. But secondly, it's no wonder. It's no wonder that for some reason we feel like there is a need to exile our playfulness from our lives of faith. We have been told to do this for centuries. But I have to say, maybe you don't feel this way, I feel this way, that feels unnatural. It just doesn't feel right. And really, it doesn't make sense. Because look at all of creation. Look at creation. It tells a different story if we're paying close attention. One of my very favorite movies in all the world is The Color Purple. And one of my very favorite quotes from that movie is um, uh, one, one uh, character says to another as they're walking past a, a field of flowers, she says, I think it ticks God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. People think pleasing God is all God cares about, but any fool living in the world can see God's always trying to please us back. And truthfully, all we really need to do is look out into the natural world to see that God has a playful side. Creation is God at play. Can you imagine anything less than a playful creator being able to come up with all kinds of different colors and textures and tastes and varieties about just about anything that we can see or touch or smell or experience with any of our senses? God delights in creation and in creating. It is apparent and you've heard me say over and over and over again that one of my very favorite things to do is to find how God leaves fingerprints everywhere in all of creation. One of my favorite places to find God's fingerprints is in the field of science because they truly are everywhere in the field of science. And I don't, obviously, I don't think at all that, that the work of God and science are mutually exclusive as a matter of fact, I, I see science as a way for dis, us to see the amazing and mysterious ways that God has created us to perfectly function and interact with each other. It's beautiful. And it seems like whenever we step outside of the laws of science, this is almost proof if you think about it, whenever we step out outside of the, law, the boundaries of the laws of science, we kind of also, at the same time, simultaneously, step outside of the will of God. And when we do that, that's when we get ourselves into the most trouble. We really, really wander into trouble a lot. Okay, so there's this scientist, and he's a researcher too. His name is Stuart Brown. And if you are a big TED Talk person, you may or may not have run across his TED Talk. It's pretty popular. Um, but also he was, has been on um, a, a show on NPR, National Public Radio, called, it used to be called Speaking of Faith. It's now called On Being. And it's uh, uh, hosted by a woman named Krista Tippett. And she, um, and she interviews a lot of different people from all kinds of different faiths, really about what, what makes them spiritual beings and, and what makes them tick, really. So she interviewed Stuart Brown, and, um, sh and, and what you need to know about him is he was trained in general and internal medicine, and also psychiatry and clinical research. But he didn't find his true calling until he began to lead, until he led a study on a group of homicidal young men. And what he discovered when he led that study was that a history, an upbringing that was, that was marked by violence and cruel behavior was a direct and negative consequence of a play-deprived life. In other words, these homicidal men, when they were little boys and young men, had been, had been told or taught or resist, whatever, they, they lived play-deprived childhoods. And he could draw a, a solid line, not even a dotted line, a solid line that connected 
the fact that they had been raised with no play and the fact that they had become violent criminals. And he could also draw that straight line between, uh, he found that commonality in all uh, humans in general. He could really, he saw it. It just showed up in all of the research. <coughs> and so, as a result, he began to get very, very interested in play. And he studied it in animals as well as in humans. And if you do get a chance to see his TED Talk, it's really, really fascinating to watch how you can see play express itself in the animal kingdom and how, it, how necessary it is, but in, huma, in humans as well. And as a result of his research, he found it, and I am so excited that something like this actually exists. There is something like this on the planet. Makes me so happy. He founded what is called the National Institute of Play. <laughs> I think this is fantastic. I love that. And so this is where he works. He, his, his work is expressed and, and what produces a lot more of the study. And in his work, he discovered that play is vital in keeping our brains flexible, flexible enough to learn and adapt and to be creative and to even work hard. Play is necessary for hard work. And I think any of us in here, probably all of us in here, who have pushed ourselves so hard, the harder we push, the less productive we may become. And we may not be willing to admit that, but the truth be told, it is only when we take a break and let our brain kind of go off and play just a little bit, take a break, that then we resume productivity. The harder we work without play, the less productive we come. It is through play that we learn empathy and trust and problem solving. As a matter of fact, Dr. Brown says that play can be a transformative force over an entire life. He says that all creatures, including humans, are created to play throughout the entire life cycle, not just when we're little kids the entire life cycle. This is how we have been created. And in addition to possibly violent behavior in adulthood, the absence of play inhibits creativity, positive risk-taking, the discovery and nurturing of innate gifts, and the ability to strengthen relationships. In other words, without play in our lives, we lose the ability to become the fully human creatures that God has created us all to be, period. We are created to play, and our lives are unhealthy and unnatural without it. In our life of faith, in our life of faith, the absence of play is downright irreverent. But hear me say this. The manner of play of which I am speaking is play without any intentional manipulation of outcome whatsoever. Put in plain speech, as Dr. Brown says, true play doesn't have a particular purpose. And that's what's great about it. If play has a purpose and that purpose begins to become more important than the act of play itself, it's not play. And so when I speak of play, I'm not referring to anything that falls in that category, especially anything that leaves, leads to destructive or self-destructive behavior. And I think you all know what I mean by that. If you don't, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so no one gets to leave here today and, say, and, and tell everyone, Pastor Eve told me I can just do anything I want because i got to play. That's not what I'm saying. If you tell, if you walk away with that, you missed my point, and you're not really playing with the spirit in the spirit in which I'm I'm speaking. I also don't in any way want to imply that there aren't deeply, deeply serious parts of our faith that need to be taken very seriously. Not only in our faith as it pertains to scripture, but in our faith as it exhibits itself in all, in all of humanity and, and our daily lives interacting with people. It's hard to see all of the horrible things that go on in the world around us, especially when people do these horrible things in the name of what they say is faith. 
It's hard to see all those things without wondering if it's actually okay to laugh and find joy. Sometimes with the knowledge that there is so much sad and suffering in the world, it's easy to think that we don't have the right to indulge our playful side, especially when there are a lot of people who don't have that privilege. We might even start to wonder if those early rigid Christians might be onto something with that whole all work and no play ideal when we look out and see all the suffering and seriousness in the world. But there are many, many, many pitfalls of a faith filled only with burden and no outlet for playfulness. I'll tell you about one. C.S. Lewis, he's, an, he's a 20th century author and theologian. Very important. He, you, you know him because he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, of which the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe are a part. He was raised to be a Christian. He was raised a Christian in a Christian household in, in the faith. But when he hit young adult or uh, youth, his, his, his teen years, he turned away from his faith. And it was because he couldn't find any joy in it. And among other things, what he had developed was this practice of prayer that was just, just horrible. He would make himself, he would be on his knees every night praying trying to pray whatever he thought was right. And he would upset himself so badly he would stay up all night until he felt like he had gotten it right. And he didn't get any sleep. He made himself sick. And it got to the point that he just flat out started dreading bedtime because he never got it right. And so he left the faith. And he proclaimed that he was never coming back. And of course, we know now that he did. But looking back on that time, he said, this ludicrous burden of false duties provided an unconscious motive, motive for wishing to shuffle off the Christian faith. So I wonder how many of us could say the same thing at different points in our lives. When f a life of faith becomes more burden than joy, and we feel like it just starts to suffocate us instead of giving us life. We feel constrained and monitored and judged, and all we want to do is just run away. And a lot of times, that's what we do. The irony in this, of course, is as Christians, we follow Jesus. And Jesus was one of the greatest advocates of enjoying life and not worrying, and yes, even playing. If you read into kind of what he's had to say, he talks about um, the, a life of faith, unburdening the overly burdened, bringing release to the captives and joy to the joyless. We heard in scripture this morning about how we are supposed to look to the birds and the lilies and how they toil not, but instead just find the joy of the Lord and joy in, they just revel in their own existence and their own creation. These are Jesus' own words. But in so many ways, we just ignore that. And we come up with our own way of following Jesus, which often feels like a prison of joyless burden. It's okay to be happy and joyful. And it is vital that we are playful in the context of our faith. And it's not just you guys on the other side of the pulpit that need to hear this. You may or may not know this, but clergy have one of the highest, if not the highest burnout rate of any profession. And there are a lot of reasons for that. The nature of this vocation is that it does bring great joy and sense of purpose, but it also brings a lot of isolation, and soul-wrenching moments. And it's nonstop. In one way or another, clergy are hardly ever off the clock. And we are notorious for pushing self-care aside until it gets piled up on top of, until everything else gets piled up on top of it and we can't find it anymore. We are notorious for that. In fact, it is a rarity to find a pastor, truthfully, I'm being completely honest right now, it is more rare to find a pastor that practices good 
it has good self-care practices, which, by the way, is a spiritual discipline. It is harder to find one that has good practices than it is to find one that doesn't. Most of us don't. And as such, we are horrible examples of what following that discipline looks like. Horrible examples. And, to, and, and, and what it means to be faithful in that way. And many of us know that. And I will be totally honest with you, I do feel it sometimes. But I've noticed that it's really, really the worst when I don't let myself play. And any of you that know me in here, know me at all, you know I like to play. You know I like to laugh and play and have a good time. But there are so many times that, the, that, that what I wind up doing is I just push that away and I don't wind up letting myself just enjoy things. But letting myself play is one of the only ways that I can keep myself from burning out. We all have to play. Clergy, laity, outside the walls of this church, inside the walls of this church, everybody needs to play. It is a betrayal of our creation not to. And so I encourage all of you to consider what it is that is your theology of play. You get to determine what it is. You get to determine how it is you read scripture and how it is you look out into creation and how it is that you feel that your faith bubbles up in you and what makes your heart sing. What is that? Figure out what being playful means to you through the lens of your own faith. And no, I am not telling you to ascribe some sort of spiritual meaning to a volleyball game that might break out at the church picnic. That is not the point. I am talking about considering how it is that playfulness helps you experience the divine love of God. How does it help you express your joy and your freedom? How does it help you create the space in your life that you need to become the amazing creature that God always planned you to be? And don't try to match any of your answers to those questions I just asked to anyone else's. Because you need to develop your own theology of play. What works for you is your most faithful response. Quiet or loud, high energy or low key, indoors, outdoors, in a crowd, all alone, whatever it is, if done in the right spirit, it not only won't be wrong, it can't be wrong. And so in that spirit, I am going to close today by sharing with you my theology of play. This does not have to be yours, can be your choice. This is mine, but I'm going to say it in two different ways. One way is in the words of an esteemed systematic theologian. His name is Jorgen Moltmann. The first thing liberated beings do is to enjoy their freedom and playfully test their newfound opportunities and powers. Why are we seeing so little of this? Have the old Pharisees and the new zealots with their conservative and revolutionary legalism scared us away from freedom, from joy, and spontane spontaneity? It is unlike anything good or just. It is unlikely that anything good or just will come about unless it flows from an abundance of joy and the passion of love. Or, this is the second way I'll say it, Christ has set you free. Now go out and live as though somebody left the gate open. Let us pray. Loving creator, giver of all joy, we confess that we get so caught up in human doing that we forget to be human beings. Help us to see all of the ways that you want us to smile or laugh. And help us to embrace the gifts of laughter and play in this beautiful and amazing world that you have created and continue to breathe creativity into. 
We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.